Faith here. Welcome to episode 5 of the Solar Punk Press Short Fiction Podcast. I am no longer sick, so uh, stuff sucks less. <laughs> this recording is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License, which means that you can share it, but don't sell it or change it. Trigger warnings are in the show notes for those who need them. This month's podcast is special because it features two stories, Last Day by Brandon Crilly and Looking Across the River from Two Directions by Scott Spiziak. An Ottawa teacher by day, Brandon Crilly has been published in OnSpec, Encounters, Non-Local Science Fiction, and other markets. He was a semi-finalist in the fourth quarter of Writers of the Future 2015. His first SF chapbook, Science is for Real, is now available at brandoncrilly.wordpress.com. You can also follow Brandon on Twitter at B underscore Crilly. Scott Spiziak lives in Virginia with his dog and a lot of pens. He can most commonly be found not sleeping. His work has appeared previously in Gray Sparrow Journal, Foliate Oak Literary Magazine, and on the website of New Politics Magazine. Narration and voice acting were done by Brechtin Drugis and me, Faith, the voice echoing into your ears right now. I don't know the order in which we're presenting these, so I'm just going to say the titles right before we perform them. That should work. Enjoy, folks. Last Day by Brandon Crilly. Carlisle glanced out each window down Rig 17's main corridor, taking in the view of the Pacific while he walked. Everyone asked him about the job on the way to his duty station. He offered them the same shrug and smile and some offhanded comment like, you know how it is, or won't know until I find out. Then, as much as he liked them all, he tried to get away as quickly as possible. Alex was the hardest to talk to, even though she was the only person who didn't ask. It was because he got along with her the best. If they hadn't been decades apart in age, he thought there would have been something more between them. They made their usual small talk, Carlyle standing in the doorway of her office while she lounged in her desk chair. Carlyle mentioned offhandedly, Still haven't heard anything yet. Did you talk to Kurt? Alex leaned in to grab the protein shake from her desk. Not yet. He usually comes to me the moment he knows something. Maybe bug him? He should know by now. Yeah. Carlyle glanced at the clock on her computer. I'll try to catch him on the way to my station. Come talk to me after. She straightened in her desk chair, posture already shifting from casual to work ready. As he turned to leave, she smiled. Onward and upward. Here's hoping. Carlyle bumped into Kurt, their rig captain, in the main corridor. Kurt had been coming to find him, red tie swishing in time with his rapid steps. The conversation went exactly how Carlyle expected, and the turning anxiety in his stomach transformed into a heavy mix of disappointment and acceptance as he walked the rest of the way to his station. The sun seemed brighter than usual through the clear glass globe that surrounded his equipment. It looked like their one-man maintenance chief had removed every scuff and grease mark from inside the station. Carlyle made a note to thank Mac on his way out. On my way out. He mused. He started his shift in the same way every day. Thermos of tea in the cup holder next to him, he ran a quick systems check to make sure everything was primed, and then rotated the twin handholds, putting the massive tractor beam into a slow roll to look for kinks. Once that was done, he leaned forward and stared out at the Pacific, taking in the sparkling waters, the low clouds on the horizon, and the bright blue sky. Even on days when it was raining buckets out there, the sight was no less beautiful. He still couldn't believe there used to be a mound of garbage churning at the ocean's heart. Sometimes he could spot the massive orbital cities glinting beyond the stratosphere, the vast and orbital nation his colleagues called On High. Those cities were beautiful too, in their own way, even though the people there didn't think twice about where their trash ended up. Carlyle checked the sensors, but there was nothing on its way down yet. A slow start to his shift seemed best. It gave him more time to enjoy the view. Tried everything I could, Kurt had told him in the corridor. The big, gray-haired man paced the width of the corridor while he spoke. Even spoke to the director. There's no way around it. Lily's got seniority, so she gets the spot. Doesn't matter that I've been here over a year? All the work I've put in? Carlyle had almost said. He and Kurt had discussed the collector's employment procedures at length, though, so he didn't bother repeating himself. Your time will come, Kurt had said. The moment something else opens up, you're a shoo-in. 
I mean, shit to Christ. Not many people want to come work in a trash rig. Not many people know how amazing it is. Carlyle thought as he looked out at the Pacific. Hard and thankless sometimes, but he couldn't imagine doing anything else. He had gotten the Rig 17 contract by a fluke, even hated it for a while, but now he didn't want to leave. The sensors chirped to signal a massive clump of trash headed their way, jettisoned from on high. The other duty stations confirmed that Carlyle had the best chance of securing it. He smiled as he brought the tractor up to full power and activated the targeting grid. Outside the globe, the tractor started to purr, almost as though it was eager for their first catch of the day. A message flashed across his comm screen from Alex. Good hunting. Carlyle grinned and gripped the handholds a little tighter. Then he spared one last glance out at the water below and whispered, Don't you worry, I got this. Looking Across the River from Two Directions by Scott Spiziak From Melagrib The window washer ran the rag over the pane one last time before admiring his work. He could only see bits of the windows through the sea of plants sitting on tables, on benches, hanging from the ceiling. Each was far from its home in the southern colonies. He was almost halfway done, the ceiling notwithstanding. He always saved it for last, never remembering what he had always been told about delayed gratification. Dawn glinted off the glass panes and brass caning. The river, stained pink, was barely visible through the fog. The house was close to the river bank, so the slums on the opposite bank seemed to rise above the city like an ocean wave floating in the fog. The window washer picked up a clean rag and continued around the greenhouse wall, washing pane by pane. The fog began clearing. He stared through it to the slums. It was near impossible to tell where each building, each garden, began and ended. The window washer searched for the home where he had grown up, where he brought money when there was enough left over. The whole place had become alien to him once he'd left it to work. He couldn't find it. A bee flew towards the window, trying to reach the flowers that bloomed despite the start of the autumn rains. The window washer stopped to watch it. It found its way in through a broken pane of glass that he had not seen. He set down his rag and inspected the damage. The bee settled onto a blue flower. The river settled at a slate gray. The window washer noticed part of a brick on the broken shards of the pane of the greenhouse's glass. It had been thrown from the street, which was still empty. A memory emerged at the top of the window washer's mind. A few nights previously, the head maid had told him in whispered tones of a war she had overheard discussion of, in a country far to the south, a revolution. As soon as the last word escaped her mouth, she was gone, hidden behind the pile of bedding she carried out of the room. He put the brick in his bag. The window washer brushed the glass shards into an empty pot, accidentally slicing open a fingertip in the process. He wrapped a rag around the wound to keep the blood off the tile floor. He washed the rest of the windows, cleaning until he had used all of his rags. He heard the head maid's footsteps. Gathering his supplies, the window washer turned around to ask her a question. To Melagrib. The gardener mounted the stairs of the roof and set to weeding the vegetable patch, so large it seemed like it would slide off into the street. It was still quiet. She was always one of the first to begin work. Masked by the fog, a few men were off to work in the factories. And below her, small clusters of women stood waiting at a well. As the sun rose, the silence would be replaced with the hum of daily activity. More recently, the hum had been supplemented by marching and chanting and singing, both in the gardener's native language and a tongue spoken at the southern tip of the continent. As the fog slowly cleared, the gardener had to squint in the harsh morning sun. The pink light glinted off the windows and gold caming of the greenhouse salons across the river. A group of bees flew down the hill from a hive a few houses back, landing on the last blooms of the season. The gardener stopped to watch them for a moment. As the bees settled into their routine, she looked across the river, searching for the house where her son worked. He had told her how to find it, four blocks over and five blocks down, or maybe it was six, from the palace's highest tower. She settled on a likely candidate. It didn't matter if she was right. The bees emerged from the flowers and flew off. The gardener returned to her work. 
A moment later, another bee emerged, not realizing it had been left behind. It flew over the river, away from the others. Her task complete, the gardener stood and brushed the dirt from her pants. She plucked a few mint leaves from the healthiest plant and brought them downstairs. She then boiled the last of the water from the day before. Next, she would have to pump that day's. She put the leaves in a mug before flooding it with water. The gardener waited by the window until her tea was ready, until the clear water ran brown. Thanks for listening to this month's story. We hope you enjoyed it. The podcast is available for download on iTunes, and you can also find us at solarpunkpress.com. Following this issue, Solarpunk Press will be taking a three-month break to apply for grants and solidify personal finances so that we can continue to feature fabulous artists and writers and bring you great content. We expect to be returning in July. The next author will be announced on our website instead of at the end of this podcast. The music in this episode was by Ben Bunker. The intro was Boom Boom Box, and the outro was I Was Three. Ben's work can be heard online at soundcloud.com slash onebeds. That's the number one and the word beds. I'll miss you guys while I'm gone, but we gotta dig up some funding so we can provide y'all with great solar punk content without going personally bankrupt. We'd love it if you could donate even just a dollar a month to our Patreon, or give us a one-time so that we can build up our reserves to fight against the capitalist flu and keep on kicking. We won't be charging our Patreon supporters again until July, so if you sign up, we won't take money until we're paying artists and writers again. Also, we may be producing some vlogs and nonfiction podcasts in the meantime, depending on our spoon count and free time. So stay tuned. We're not going away, and we're definitely going to keep writing and world building during the hiatus. Thank you for all your ongoing support, whether it be just by tuning in or by throwing a dollar or two our way. We really value your input and engagement, and you've made us the publication we are today. So folks, thanks for listening. Until next time. <laughs>